Leanne, Ron, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Leanne, would you introduce yourself and our guest? Um, yes, my name is Leanne Yates, and I'm a practicing risk manager. I have about 25 years experience, um, really kind of practicing nationwide, um, large acute care physician practices or acute care hospitals, um, clinics, that sort of thing. And I'm here today uh, with one of our guests, Ron Marney. Ron comes to us as an attorney who primarily uh, practices in Missouri. He has over 25 years experience um, in litigation and trial experience. Ron has served on the defense side for many, many years, and but now he also serves on the plaintiff side. He covers everything from corporate business law, personal injury, medical malpractice, insurance law, appellate matters, and mediation and arbitration. Ron comes well-versed and is a very strong litigator. So Ron, thank you for coming on today. I'm excited about our conversation. And I'd like to, you know, kind of ease into, um, you know, you and I practiced together in Missouri when I was living there. And, you know, there was lots of different cases that you were there bailing us out, uh, defending, you know, the hospital system. And I know in particular, um, I remember one of the physicians that was involved in, in a litigation that we had was so distraught um, because he thought he was gonna get out of a case. And at the very last day when the statute limitation was gonna expire, the plaintiff attorney ended up filing suit. And so it's important because these physicians, you know, supporting them, figuring out, you know, how to best support your physician team, but also educating them on the law, what to expect. And this particular doctor reached out to both of us and can you kind of talk about, um, you know, your style and, you know, how you prepare physicians for what's to come? Because as we know, litigation doesn't just go away overnight. It may take a year, two years, three years, depending on what kind of case it is. And um, I know the one thing that I will say that you and I have in common is we are both um, seeking justice and the truth. And throughout the litigation process, I mean, that has been your charge from day one is, you know, what is the truth and how do you get to the truth when people are scared, they're afraid they're going to lose their job. Um, maybe they know they didn't do a good job and they were the one that made the error that maybe killed somebody. So talk to us a little bit first about, you know, representing physicians and getting them in that comfort zone of what to expect for the short and long term. And then we can kind of ease into a few other questions surrounding, you know, preparing nurses, preparing, you know, a myriad a number of healthcare providers for, you know, setting them up for the long haul with the litigation and what is going to happen. Well, the key for any healthcare provider that's been sued is good communication, uh, especially the ones that have been sued for the first time and have never been through it. You know, they spent lots of years in medical school, nursing school and practicing, but until you've actually been served papers, you've been sued and somebody's coming after you, um, they don't really know what the experience is like. And this particular doctor that, that you mentioned, I, I remember him well, um, he, he thought his whole life was, was going to be ruined by this. Um, he thought he was going to lose his job, lose his license and not be able to work and and his house and, and everything else. Um, so he got to you first. And I think that you did a good job with him by just, you know, talking him off the, the ledge that, that this is not the, the disaster that it seems like. And I spent a bunch of time with him, two or three meetings before he was convinced that he wasn't gonna get fired. Um, but the, another thing that, that absolutely distresses any defendant is when you tell them this is, probably not going to go away next week or next month or maybe not even next year, but it's not going to be a, a, a constant attack on you. You'll have a couple of things that you'll need to do, but other than communicate with me, um, things are going to be okay. And that's really what they need to hear, that things are going to be okay, even if the case is going to get settled or, or tried. Right, right. And I know there's a lot of fretting going on. You know, you mentioned if a case gets settled or tried, is reporting to the National Practitioner Data Bank or whatever governing board might require reporting. 
you know, if that hospital participates in Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, the institution has a duty to report any settlement monies that are paid. So that kind of changes things. And talk to us about that, because I know, you know, folks are nervous and they got to be able to work. And if they have been reported multiple times um, through any of those agencies, whether it's the medical board, the nursing board, you know, um, CMS, what have you, that sometimes they don't understand why. And, and I would say oftentimes they don't understand why they're being reported. And you and I have had multiple discussions about this is whether or not you can dismiss a party prior to a settlement and that way they don't get reported. But then there's a lot of questions and dialogue surrounding that as to, is that ethical? Is that an ethical business practice? And does that put anybody at risk, you know, that has been involved in the case? Well, the National Practitioners Database is what they get reported to. Any settlement really is supposed to be to be reported. And I never lead with that when I'm meeting with a doctor or, or anybody because they, when they hear about that, they think, well, it's, I'm, I'm blacklisted. It's like the 50s and I'm, I'm not going to be able to get another job or work again. And that's not the case at all. Um, and like you said, a lot of times you can settle a case, like for a physician, uh, settle on behalf of the hospital, the nurses, without them getting reported at all. You're not supposed to do that if the real negligence is with the doctor. Um, but a lot of times you have cases where the doctor didn't really do anything wrong. They're they're in the in the lawsuit because they're the captain of the ship, but the nurses didn't tell them something or uh, or did something else that that really puts the liability on, on people other than the doctors. Um, lots of doctors get reported to the data bank um, and it's a super secret data bank. Uh, I couldn't, I can't just go look, look up a doctor and, and see what their entries are in the data bank. And if I subpoenaed it from a hospital uh, because they would go in a credentialing file at the hospital where the, where the doctor works or is on, on staff, I, they don't have to give it to me either. Uh, that they only really um, are for insurance companies who are doing underwriting uh, and employers. Mm -hmm. So, an, a one entry or two entries in a data bank for cases that are settled really does not hurt the doctor at all. If you have yeah. ten, that can that might that might be different, uh, and that's about the most I've seen. But mm -hmm. but it's yeah. not something that's really going to hurt them. Right. And I know, I mean, it, like you said, it would be different if you had five or 10 of a million dollars being reported versus one at 50,000, one at 10,000, one at less than 100. I think that also makes a difference. So let's go back. Um, when we were talking about seeking justice and the truth, talk to us about, you know, you've had a long, very successful stint um, working the defense side. What would make you want to crossover into on the plaintiff side? Well, I've been defending doctors and hospitals my whole career. Um, when I got out of law school, I thought I wanted to be a plaintiff's lawyer. And when the big firm started recruiting me, I, I decided that that was the way to go. But I, but I have all these years seen really injured people. Um, and not to bash anybody specifically, but their lawyers sometimes don't do that good a job for them. And I thought, you know, I could, I really could help this person uh, if I represented him. And that, that's part of what attracted me to it. But I, I also, there's something to be said for, for representing individuals. You know, a hospital is really just a building. Um, right. You have your risk manager that you like and you interact with, but, but the hospital is a building in the end. Well, I know, um, you know, just because you are doing plaintiff's work, I mean, that from a, the standpoint of a risk manager, you can be friends with them. You can talk to them. I mean, it's better to be as um, aligned as possible, just so, you know, you don't want to dig your heels in and make it difficult for the other side and tick people off, right? So is there a, a specific threshold that has to be met in order for you to take a case? Well, sure. Lots of thresholds. Um, mm -hmm there are three or four elements that you have to be able to prove on every case to, to uh, succeed at all. And a, a old plaintiff's lawyer a long time ago told me, and this is stuck for 20 something years. 
it's better to have no cases than to have a bad case because a bad case you're pouring money down a down a hole that you're never going to get back um but ideally you want good likable plaintiffs you want clear negligence you want causation and uh future damages and a, a jerk for a defendant and some kind of cover-up <laughs> and i'd like to be six foot three with all the hair that i had 20 years ago it, you don't see cases like that they all have warts they all have holes that you that you have to that you have to deal with but having good likable plaintiffs goes a long way well, i know you're taller than me so <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, when, what drives you? Like when you get up and start your day, what is the main thing that drives you as a plant attorney? Well, that's a tough question. I, I, I guess every day I wanna move the ball down the field um, a little bit in one way or another on, on one case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, when a patient has been injured, it's our duty to make them whole or as whole as we can um, and do the right thing. I mean, I know as a risk manager, it is our creed to like, you know, justice and ethics and doing the right thing. And so when I think about that um, and some risk managers get really nervous, they are not comfortable talking to plant lawyers because they feel like they're always trying to be tricked and they're trying to get them into a hole where they can't get out or maybe they may, might be afraid of making an admission and then they're stuck. So what do you have to say about that? I mean, you guys surely just don't go in trying to trick everybody. I mean, you're out for justice and the truth, correct? Absolutely. The only time I'm trying to trick somebody is in a deposition when I say, trust me, I'm not trying to trick you. That's when the trick <laughs> question comes. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think you should have communication with, with the lawyers on the other side. Um, I, if you do with me, I'll tell you all kinds of things. Um, I hope to not be hiding anything in my case and I'll, I'll lay it out on the table and you can learn all kinds of things about the case that might take you six months or a year to get uh, if you're just having a defense lawyer hammer it out of them. Uh, it's a good idea. And I think that just goes back to what I have said time and time again is listening well. Because in you, if you're in a conversation, you're talking about a case and you're talking to a plant attorney that you guys are on the business side adverse to one another, but you might be friends on the outside or see, see them at the gym or see them out at a restaurant or what have you. We have to make sure that we maintain professionalism and, you know, that we can communicate and listening, you know, is there anything I can learn about what you're after and you know, um, I know sometimes risk managers or it might not even be the risk manager, like they don't really know when you think about the discovery process in a case that's in litigation and what you can and should or should not give up. I mean, some are new. They're not necessarily comfortable just going in there knowing exactly telling you straight up, you can't have that. You know, you're going to have to challenge me in court or whatever. Those things come up. And so, is there anything that you can um, lend to that aspect? And, you know, um, you guys also have an ethical creed and, you know, rules and guidelines that plant attorneys go by. It's not like it's just car blanche and you do what you want, correct? Correct. So you don't intentionally try to violate the law. <laughs> right. Uh, I think that's where your, your defense counsel comes in. Um, even if you haven't retained one, on a case, you called me lots of times to ask about, you know, something that something that comes up. What should I do with this? It's not in litigation yet, and mm -hmm. they can they can be a big help and point you in the right direction. and And they want to help you because they want to get the case if it gets filed. Right. Yeah, and I think that's too. You know, I talk in um, multiple venues about surrounding yourself with good people because you can't possibly be everything to everyone every single day and be on your game. Some days you have a bad day, but surrounding yourself with good lawyers and every role that I have held as a risk manager or a senior executive, I have a good lawyer on my team because I know everything that we touch has a legal implication. And if, if I'm not thinking of one thing or the other, hopefully that person will point it out. Or if we, for instance, language in a release or language in a policy and procedure, things like that. 
it's always nice to get the legal slant too. And I think also, um, especially for new risk managers, the legal uh, team and the lawyers and the, um, the team on the other side, they can help um, train you up, so to speak, and help you know fill in any knowledge gaps that you might have, especially if you haven't practiced long and you're not, you're maybe not familiar with um, some of the legal aspects of a case. I think also that is a benefit of having that good relationship with your attorney, whether it's your defense attorney or your plaintiff attorney, because as you know, in some venues, you will see the same plaintiff attorney time and time again, you know, that um, people come to, like you're good. That's one of the things um, that happens when you're good at your job is people seek you out. So you want to foster those relationships to make sure, you know, if, which leads to my next question about early resolution and being aggressive on the front end. You and I have partnered many, many times. And, you know, the first question is what's the settlement value? What's the verdict value? What are the damages? And so as a plaintiff attorney, some attorneys, it feels like, and maybe this is true, they have some sort of algorithm that they have to do some discovery before they even enter into those discussions. What do you say about that? I mean, I know you might have your own style. It, it depends on the case, but uh, the, the cases I'm handling right now, I've already gone to the risk managers and said, look, I, I've got this case. Um, and in one of them, there's some pretty bad facts uh, about the doctor who's a very, very prominent uh, doctor and what he did and why he even did it. And, and they've said, well, don't file suit. Uh, get your stuff together, get it to us, get us a demand and let's, let's have a mediation before you file suit. Because the stuff that is gonna go in that, in that petition are things that nobody wants to see in the newspaper and they appear to be absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, but it's always a good idea to, to try to get get in front of a case and take a shot at settling it early because you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars defending a case that you you end up paying what you about what you could have paid uh, before the suit even got got filed. See, and that's the thing that I always point out is the financial aspect of cases. If you take the emotion out, you know what matters is dollars going out the door and your risk exposure. And when you're evaluating your enterprise risk and you have, you know, you're looking for trends, you're looking for patterns. Uh, but for me, I'm aggressive. I want to shut it down. If I know there's problems with the case, I want to shut it down as soon as possible. And as soon as I have enough information to do so. So sometimes plaintiff attorneys will send you what's called a demand package or a demand letter and sometimes they're transparent straight up. And, you know, I've had multiple this year that I've worked with that, you know, they're like, here's the CD, here's the records, you know, I'm willing to talk to you, I'm open. Um, and so there, some will not, some are just like, no, you know, we're gonna go through discovery a little bit and then, you know, we'll circle back with you on whether or not we wanna settle the case. So I, I think that's good, you know, it is illogical to spin your wheels and spend all that money working a case up when, like you just said, you may settle for the same amount of money that you could have two years ago, or you might have to pay a premium because if you've ticked people off in that whole process, um, and if you've been difficult, well, guess what? Usually that's not well received on the plaintiff side and you may end up having to pay a premium. Um, I hate to see that happen, um, but I've known multiple people where that has happened to. And so I would advise the risk managers that are watching this video and listening to our conversation, get to it early. Um, you know, and I think it just builds rapport and respect because when the next one comes around, maybe it won't be so difficult. And you kind of trust to a certain degree, uh, the person sitting on the other side, that's really going to sue you. You're going to see them in court. And if they're good, you, you might be in trouble if you just, you know, continue to be um, adverse and, and not try to think, uh, you know, smart about it, walking through how to cap your exposure and how to limit money going out the door. Um, so the one thing I was interested in, in talking with you about, Ron, is, you know, with this whole COVID thing going on for the last year and a half, two years, is like juries 
any immunities um, in the states that you practice. So can you talk to us a little bit about that, um, how it's applicable, is anything being challenged? And on the plaintiff side, the plaintiff bar, are you guys lobbying for anything specific? I don't know about any lobbying efforts, but I do know that almost every state has immunities uh, mm -hmm. for COVID, COVID related uh, claims and not very many of them are getting filed. Um, and the immunities are pretty strong in Kansas and Missouri where I practice mostly and most states, it looks like they're all pretty similar. You can find some really good charts um, on online, the doctors.com and Hush Blackwell has one, a state by state analysis of, of, of what it is in every state. But most of them, what they've said is you can't file a lawsuit based on COVID related care or treatment or prevention unless you can show essentially a punitive damage standard like wanton misconduct, gross um, negligence or uh, recklessness. And that's that's a very high standard, especially to be able to prove it up front because you're gonna get a, a motion for summary judgment or a motion to dismiss because there's no showing of, of, a, of egregious conduct like that. So right. I think that that's gonna hold the cases off for a while. There will be challenges that that's unconstitutional, I'm sure, um, but nobody really knows. We haven't seen a pandemic like this in a hundred years. Right. Yeah, I know with the cases that I have been getting and have seen, you know, there's fail, failure to treat, failure to warn, failure to prevent infection, um, you know, uh, failure to train and um, documentation issues. There might be policy and procedure deviations. Because the one thing that you guys ask um, on the plaintiff side and really the, the defense side, once a lawsuit is filed, you're going to want the policies and procedures, right? And you, you want to uh, get the records and you're going to look at the documentation. Was the story told in the records? Or, you know, if there are gaps, you're going to make up your own story to fit the what you're trying to do and what you're trying to convey to a jury. Sure. Policies and procedures are a big deal. Um, yeah. Uh, not just for COVID, but for every case. Um, and you know this because I've, I've told you before, but uh, when there's a policy or procedure at issue and you go meet with the nurse, nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100, they've never even seen those policies. Uh, right. Hospitals have thousands of policies on all kinds of things. Um, and the worst thing that you can do is, is produce somebody. They, they ask questions about what might be in a policy, then they get the policy and, and your treater doesn't know anything about it and, and looks silly. It, it, it's pretty devastating. So one thing I would do early on is whenever, in any case, figure out what policies and procedures you might have and whether somebody might've violated them and, and educate the healthcare providers. Here are the policies that are at issue and what, but what do you think about this? What, what did you do? because that's one of the easiest ways to get in trouble, I think. And that is so true. In all the healthcare facilities that I have been in across the US, that is like the main number one glaring problem that I don't even have to look very hard for. Either they don't know how to get in to get them, or they are old, they're not based on best practice, or maybe the best practice has changed. Um, so, the one question I wanted to ask you is, here's, here's one of the things that we struggle with is when we have an event and there was harm and something needs to be changed, you know, within the protocol or what have you, doing that in the midst of litigation sometimes isn't that great because then you're going to come back and say, well, see there, they knew they, knew they did something wrong. They changed it midstream. What's your recommendation from the plaintiff side when that happens? I would say be proactive about it. There's a objection to that called subsequent remedial measures that keeps it out of evidence. So if you got a problem um, and you're in you're in litigation and you fix the problem, they should not be able to get that get that into evidence in most cases because the the theory behind that is you want people to fix problems. You don't want somebody else to get hurt because of something that you didn't fix because you're in litigation. Right. Yeah. Because if, I mean, if we don't fix it right away, I mean, it's hard, you know, everybody's crunched on time. It's hard to go back and, you know, do something 
two years from now when the lawsuit settles or maybe you go to trial or what have you. Is there, with respect to going to trial, do you think the juries are becoming more plaintiff oriented or wanting to award large sums of money um, in, in consideration of, you know, the pandemic and all that's going on and people have lost their jobs? It's hard to say. Um, very few cases have gone to trial um, since the pandemic. Um, and very few cases are going to go to trial for a while, I think, in part because it's coming back, but also because the criminal cases that, have, that are backlogged, those, those defendants have a right to a speedy trial. A civil defendant does not. So before, until they clear a bunch of the criminal cases off the dockets, a lot of cases are not going to get tried. But having said that, there have been a couple of medical trials here in Kansas City in the last couple of weeks with huge verdicts. Uh, one of them, a real runaway verdict. So really? that's a small sample, but it sounds good for me. Well, it seems like, you know, everyone is in a, is hurting. Either they're, you know, they're struggling emotionally with depression, then they lose their job. Maybe their employer just shut down and couldn't um, withstand the pandemic and, every, you know, all the stressors of that. And there's not enough money to keep the business open. So I think from what I'm starting to see, it seems like there might be a shift where the mindset of jurors might be more open-minded to award, you know, more money than they normally would because, you know, this whole pandemic has affected everyone personally. And I think, you know, once you have that personal experience, it kind of changes your perspective and it changes the way you look at things. So I wouldn't be surprised once we start seeing more cases go to trial, if, if that doesn't start occurring, you know, and I know, you know, like Cook County and Dade County, in Florida, those sorts of venues have always been a hotbed and, you know, uh, people shy away from taking things to trial in those venues. But I think there's probably going to be other venues across the U.S. that maybe become a hotbed. I mean, what do you think about that? I, I think you might be right. Um, and I think it may affect the way people pick juries yeah. um, because it's important. You if, if it is the people that have lost their jobs or lost relatives um, that are that are going to be more plaintiff oriented, I think the Vince Council needs to try to keep those people off juries as best they can. It's going it, to it's going to be a little while before we figure out how that's going to go, I think. Well, and are you guys doing in-person juries now? Because I know there for a while, everybody was like, you know, the struggle was you know, getting people up the elevator and then you had to sit six feet apart. What about Missouri and Kansas? Well, Missouri uh, has started doing uh, in-person juries. There have been a few jury trials, uh, but I, I heard on Friday that uh, Clay County, which is around Liberty, Missouri, has canceled everything. There was a, a hearing that a, a colleague of mine was going to Friday and she walked up and the door was locked. <laughs> and really? There was, yeah, there's somebody there and she said, well, I have a, a hearing in an hour and he said not anymore they cancel them all um, wow and they've started mask mandates in jackson county which is the the big county in kansas city and i won't be surprised if they shut those court court downs courthouses down too yeah because you th you're like well you know how is this going to work are we going to like i think the good thing that's come out of the pandemic it has really forced organizations to be more creative in their business practices and how can they do things alternatively and leverage technology, um, you know, but you, but you lose, if you're in person and you see, you know, you're trying to pick the jury and stuff, you see body language and stuff like that. I think you do lose a component of that when we're doing things through Zoom, but it is efficient. I mean, you don't even have to leave your house, but I mean, the other challenge to that is you don't know if somebody's got a recorder behind you and they've got it turned on or um, if there's other person persons in the background that are hearing like the details of the case. And how do you keep confidentiality kind of bottled up the way it's supposed to be um, to protect those involved? I don't know how they're going to do that. And I hope it doesn't come to that because like you say, I'm kind of old school. I want to see if somebody's sweating. Yeah. Uh, or their hands are shaking or anything, uh, because that, that's how you separate the, the good ones from the bad ones. Uh, sometimes a lot more than what they say than what they do and how they say it. Right. Right. 
When you think about um, the role of risk managers and, you know, our role is huge. We're trying to be, you know, manage stuff across the enterprise. And if you have a large enterprise, it can be very difficult. And, you know, oftentimes we feel like we are doing it hamstring because we don't have enough staff or, you know, things are running so fast and furious. Can you think of anything from your lens and where you sit, what we could do differently to improve our business practices and mitigate our potential loss exposure? I guess the first thing I would say is, is get involved early. And I said that before, um, if you have, because risk managers here within a day or two, if something um, bad has happened to a patient typically and talk to the people early. Uh, if you wait a year before a case is filed, um, some of those people may be gone. And I, I had a disaster thing happen to me. Um, I had a very important anesthesiologist who uh, had, had left the hospital and we're trying a case and we wanted, we wanted to go talk to him because he made a couple of very critical entries in the record. And the plaintiff's attorney took the position because he was no longer employed by the hospital that HIPAA precluded me from talking to him. And the judge bit on that. And we didn't get to, to interview this guy but before he testified. And if we had gotten involved earlier, somebody could have talked to him. Um, I, we ended up winning the case, but, I, but I, it would have caused me a lot less heartburn. Yeah. We did not appeal that because we didn't want that ruling to, to get upheld and, and go statewide. I'm not sure that it was right, but it's a risk. People, people forget things. People, people uh, leave. Maybe they get fired and they're mad at you now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's key too is, you know, you don't want to wait. If you're doing an interview and trying to do your investigation on an untoward event or something that happened that may or may not have had patient harm, you don't want to wait a year from now because you're right, people's memories fade and they can't possibly remember the details that you need and that would be helpful a year from now, two years from now. And you're right. I mean, they could be a hostile witness. I mean, we worry about that on the defense side too is, you know, some, if you're have like a, like a toxic culture and the employee's mad anyway, and then they get fired because they did something egregious. You know, you just have to, as risk managers, you have to drill back and keep asking why, why, why. And, you know, hopefully, you know, you've done an RCA to kind of figure out that. I recently had, you know, a couple of cases where there were staff that were fired um, due to uh, what happened and they were hostile, you know, and you don't want somebody like that to be your representative in trial because they're going to kill you <laughs> and right. you may lose the case depending on what role they played in the in the delivery of health care so i but the other thing too is um like media attention and stuff like that because i know we had a couple of big cases uh that you and i worked on and i think you have to be careful who responds to media requests. I had a case recently of a CEO that was advised not to respond to um, an article that the plaintiff put in the newspaper about his client and about their organization. And that CEO decided that they would just go ahead and respond because they felt the duty to defend their staff. Well, the demand went up multiple millions of dollars because it ticked the plaintiff attorney off once he read the response. And so, you know, whether you're on the defense or the plaintiff side, trying to fix that is problematic, you know, especially if things are in writing and you were advised by counsel not to respond. And so it's not that we want to say no comment, right? And it's not like we're hiding something. We just have to be thoughtful on how we lay it out there because once risk managers need to know, once something's in writing, it could always come back to haunt you. Um, so that's why we have specific or we should have specific rules or policies and procedures around media attention, um, whether that's internet, because I'm sure, you know, you've seen like a big influx of, you know, people are, it's so quick to put a picture on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. My loved ones in the hospital, look how they're treating them and um, this, that, and the other. And then that, you can't get that photo down, then people are snagging it. And if you're in a case that's in litigation, 
you know, I, I always had to monitor that. And I've had situations where we had a doctor that was doing surgery on a gentleman and he snapped a picture of the part of the body he was doing surgery on and said, this guy ruined my night, but he was in a small venue. People probably could have figured out, you know, who it was that was in the ER that night. Well, we, we asked him to remove it. And then we, you know, he was being difficult and Henri and he's like, it's my personal page. What do you say about that? When somebody says, that's my personal page, you have no right as an employer um, to make me do whatever you're wanting me to do with my information, even though technically it wasn't his information, even though he didn't use the patient's name, it's still enough detail um, where you could kind of figure it out. And um, it was interesting because in this scenario, one of his colleagues was the one that um, notified, you know, the administrator. Well, that's um, a pretty bad plan to be to be uh, publishing some patients' uh, body parts. I think that that's enough to be a HIPAA violation, yeah. um, especially if you're in a small community and you can figure out who might have been in the hospital. Um, I don't know how the um, that that shakes out. I think an employer does have the right to 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 keep their employees from violating federal statutes, but that's a that's a tricky spot. It is. And I think it's, you know, um, it's not always well received when, but nowadays, you know, when you um, are hired somewhere, you know, usually there's a document that you sign that all information you can count on that it's not private. So if you're at your computer and you're using a company computer and you log on to uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, you can assume that somebody's watching that and there's nothing that's private. So be careful risk managers on when that happens. Or I had another situation where there was a staff member watching a movie at work. And I was like, how in the world (laughs) do they have time to watch a movie? They didn't. They were just, you know, they were being difficult. So that is, um, that is like front and center in some venues I know. But when we think about, you know, we kind of covered a lot of different topics today from physician representation, uh, depositions, nurses, just that whole legal aspect. Um, are there any three nuggets, the top three nuggets that you would um, say to risk managers? Um, and it might be other lawyers or adjusters that might be listening to our uh, podcast. Is there anything that you feel like you want them to walk away from our discussion? You should have gotten this out of our dialogue. Well, communication uh, is, no, is number one. Communicate with your lawyers. Uh, don't be afraid to communicate with with plaintiff's lawyers uh, because not all of them are trying to trick you. You'll get a lot of you'll get a lot of good information that, that may help you evaluate a case early and and get it off your books early. And the the other point on on early uh, mediation, early settlements, uh, the actual plaintiffs, the the injured people or their families, that's music to their ears because the plaintiff's lawyers are telling them look we we're probably two years away from trial and if we try the case and we win it it's probably going to get appealed so that's going to take another one to two years so before you really recover anything it might be four or five years uh if you come in and say uh well we're not going to give you everything that you think you could possibly get but what would it be worth you to you to get it now uh, and not have a, not have an appeal or or anything, and I a lot of a lot of individuals will beat their lawyers up to make them do that. It's a it's a it's a good practice. Um, I would say uh, hire real trial lawyers, and we're kind of a dying breed. Uh, there's a whole generation out there that that hasn't had any trial experience. I I had a a super smart guy from one of my former firms come interview with me. Um, and he would have made less because he was at one of the top paying firms in, in Kansas City. But he said, you know, I'm almost a fifth year associate and I've never taken a deposition and I'm a litigator. Wow. <laughs> um, you don't want that person trying your case. Um, right. And I, I also think it's a good idea to try your winners. Um, if you have a case where you really don't think you have negligence, you have a good doctor, try them. Uh, because there are lawyers and there are defendants out there that every plaintiff's lawyer knows 
that if I get them, it's going to settle because he hadn't tried a case in 25 years. Uh, don't be that person or hire that person. Right. And I know too, like some risk managers, you know, folks like yourself walk in and they've got a suit on and they're like, oh no, <laughs> they're just like, it makes them super nervous, but you know, you can't walk in in a golf shirt. <laughs> I guess you could, but um, you know, that's one thing that I hear a lot from other, you know, folks that maybe aren't so used to that environment, or you might just have clinicians from the floor. They, that's what they do is they take care of patients. They're not with the legal team. They're not used to that. And so just the, the way people dress and it sounds silly, but it, it kind of sets the mood, whether you're going to be nervous or like, Oh, wow, I'm just going to sit. But, you know, when I talked about listening well, and risk managers need to coach their folks to make sure, and I know you and I had this issue on, you know, multiple um, people that we were working with at the hospital, is make sure you let whoever's asking the question, ask the full question, and you might want to pause a minute. Don't just jump in there and try to tell them a whole bunch of stuff. Only ask the question. Don't add to it. Don't fluff it up. Um, because I know oftentimes when people get nervous, they just... They're, they just want to run their mouth. They want to tell you everything. And then when folks like yourself are sitting across the table, they're just smiling and they're like, keep talking. <laughs> because right. that's only gonna, yeah, that's only going to like make you sit there longer. It's like, oh, I have one more question. I actually have 10 more questions based on what you just said. And I know the defense lawyers are like kicking them under the table and saying, you know, what are you doing? Um, so I think that's also, you know, important, but it's, it sounds so elementary uh, to keep saying communication, but communication is hard and it's huge. And it, it's everything that we do every single day. And it can be really, really difficult to be a good communicator and a good listener. Cause I think we have to train ourselves to less than better because we're in our mind, you know, everybody's just thinking about what's next, what they got to do and, or their next meeting. And they're not really listening. They're not fully present. But I think to do a good job, you've got to train yourself to be fully present and listen well and, and sit and wait. It's okay to pause. It's okay to take a minute and think about the question. And also you could ask your lawyer, can you restate the question? I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. And in addition to that, if you don't know, don't make it up. Just say, I don't know. And that's, that's your answer. You don't know. You don't want to just assume or make things up because that's going to get you in a jam. Absolutely. But I would caution you on, on, on coaching witnesses to pause because it can backfire. Mm -hmm. um, I had a doctor um, who was really smart, Mayo trained infectious disease guy. Um, and I was putting him on the stand in a trial and the risk manager, not you, uh, got to him that morning and said, uh, okay, so after every question, pause. Oh, no. You answer. <laughs> because if you don't do that, when, when you get to a hard question that you're not sure about and you pause, then it'll make you look bad. And so uh, he's up there and I'm just asking him regular questions. What's your name? <laughs> Dr. Hmm. It's like 15 seconds with totally pregnant pauses. Next question, um, what's, what's, your, what's your profession? I'm a physician. And my boss <laughs> walks up and whispers in my ear, did this guy have a stroke this morning? What's going on? Make him stop doing that. And you can't make him stop doing it. The, the, the horse is out of the barn. I couldn't talk to him. I just had to keep asking him questions. It was the worst examination ever. Uh, and I didn't have any idea that she had done that. <laughs> Oh no. Yeah. You don't want to do that. Nope. When I say pause. I mean, like if you really are trying to put the question together in your mind, not after everything. <laughs> well, you want to make sure that they have the whole question out before you, before you start to answer that that's for sure. But uh, listening to the whole question and yeah. answering just what the question is and not other stuff will keep yeah. you out of trouble. <laughs> Yeah. Don't be scared. Your defense lawyers, um, new risk managers should have lunch with them. They'd love to buy you lunch uh, and get comfortable with them from the start uh, because they're there to help you. And almost all of them can. 
Yeah, and I, you know, as I mentioned, um, and I think in another segment, you know, we always have an approved counsel list and stuff, and the risk managers really need to go see you in trial if we ever get back to having trials. <laughs> right. And we, you know, they need to get comfortable with your skill set because not all lawyers, like you might have a baby case and maybe one of your lawyers, that's not their niche and that's not their focus. Or you might have more of a generalist, or he might just be focused on ED stuff. So you're right. It is very, very important to develop those relationships that you need on a daily basis. Because, you know, and, and you are one of those folks that are there every single time, you know, I've picked up the phone and others have picked up the phone to call you as things happen in real life. And it's not like we can say, I'll call you back on Monday. <laughs> They're at your door and they're not leaving until it's handled. Right. <laughs> and you might have dinner plans at 6 p.m. and you're like, I'm not, I'm going to be late. Um, I was at one facility and I was working 12 to 14 hours a day and I was certain they were trying to kill me because I was like, I, you know, the, the state department is always at the um, door every single day investigating stuff. And um, it was just that sort of culture. We even had them sit in a, an office we designated that office for the person. It was always the same one, come out, come out. So it's, it's just crazy. So I think, you know, being able to align and determine who your legal team is that is going to insulate you in the facility um, and make recommendations, you know, they might show up at your claims review meeting in the hospital that you have with the board or the C-suite. And you want somebody that's strong, that knows the law, you know, because we've all had those lawyers that have not been so good. And maybe we would want them to represent us differently. But I think that just goes back to you got to know your lawyers. You got to go out and visit with them, have lunch with them, have dinner with them, whatever the case might be. Watch them in trial, watch them in a deposition. There's a lot that risk managers um, are taught by by the lawyers by you know going to depositions and setting things up and talking and and for me those moments are just priceless because that helps build your skill set and it makes you where you are delivering more value than you would if you didn't have that training and you know most of the risk managers unless you've gone to law school law school you didn't go to law school so maybe you don't have that component but there's always a way to shore it up. And, there, and if you don't know the answer to a question, you should be able to call your lawyer and say, hey, look, just yes, no, what is the deal? Where do I look for this? And they'll help you. Well, one other rule is tell your defense lawyers, don't get me deposed. I'm the risk manager. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think I ever produced you. I don't think I've ever produced a risk manager. Uh, no, because so it wasn't much of, you. It was someone else. <laughs> so, so much of what you know is attorney-client privilege, mm -hmm. um, all kinds of reasons that you shouldn't depose a, a risk manager. It's kind of like asking to depose the CEO of the hospital. Yeah. Never well, let that happen. The, you know the dirt. You know where the skeletons are. Yes. I will tell you one thing. I had early on in my career, I had just begun my career and... Um, I had settled a case and in the release, I told counsel to put confidentiality in the release. It was in the state of California. So I flew out there. I was out there for the mediation, settled the case. We had the language in there. Well, that attorney sent somebody else and he had somebody else do the work and that language was not in the release. So I got called to court to go up into the stand. The judge wanted to talk to me. And the lawyer, who is not the original lawyer, said, oh, you'll be up there just a minute. It won't be a big deal. He didn't prep me. And I was just thinking about making my flight home. <laughs> like, okay, if it's only a minute, fine. We can't get out of this. No, you need to go up there. Just talk to her. She was the nastiest judge I've ever met in my life. Get up there. I was on the stand for an hour. And it was the worst experience of my life. She grilled me and, you know, um, tried to belittle me and just, you know, who's in control of this case, you know, in all the stuff. And so I would caution risk managers, if someone says to you, it's only going to be a minute and your lawyer hasn't prepped you, take a step back and, you know, don't agree to it because it could be a disaster. And needless to say, I fired that lawyer on the spot. I was like, you will never do work for us again. You're, you're done. And got on my plane, went back and did what I need to do to take them off the panel list. But 
though, but those lessons are, are experiences that you'll never forget. They get tattooed in your mind and you're like, I will, you know, now you know what to look for. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes something like that to really um, get like the, like the ramifications if something's not done the way you intended it to be. Um, but I, I will say this though, throughout my career, the times of failure are the times of learning. And that gives you the grit to be good and to know your job really well. Because I guarantee you, most of us are overachievers and we will never forget it. <laughs> try to make sure others don't forget it. Um, but lots of fun stories like that. And uh, I know that um, we're kind of at the end of our hour. And I just want to, again, thank you so much for agreeing to come on today. And I, it's been wonderful seeing you again. It's been a while. Just Great to, to see you. <laughs> so thank well, you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you both. <laughs> Before you go, do you have okay. a, any, a fun story to tell me about Leanne? Uh, no, I'm no. not going there. <laughs> okay. Remember, remember, Ron, you're under confidentiality agreement. <laughs> right, but I'm, I'm being recorded, so I'm going to be careful. <laughs> uh, one thing about confidentiality that you mentioned, um, and it this gets messed up a lot. Uh, if you negotiate a settlement and you offer to pay some pay something and a, and a plaintiff agrees, uh, and then for the first time you put confidentiality in your release, some of those lawyers will say, "Well, we didn't negotiate that. If you want confidentiality, you owe me another fifty thousand." Yeah. Uh, and it it can put a you know a risk manager or or defense lawyer in a terrible spot because you you can't go back and ask for fifty thousand more than you already settled the case for. So with, with your offer to settle, you need to say, I, I'm going to pay this much and I want uh, confidentiality as part of the deal. And then you'll get it for free. Yeah, because, you know, all the plaintiff lawyers and defense lawyers, I mean, everybody likes to tout the cases that they have settled, right? especially if it's a high price. And when you try to cap that and say, you can't talk about this in any, you know, social media form that kind of twists things and leaves a bad taste in their mouth. Like, well, that's not what we do. And we're good trial lawyers. And so we'll just try the case. Right. So, yeah. Most of them, I've never seen that happen. Um, yeah. Most plaintiff's lawyers want, want to get the money for their clients. And um, in, in a lot of ways, it's better for the, for the plaintiff, for everybody in town, not to know that they just got a gigantic check. So right. that's another yeah. way to look at it. Well, is there the one other question I wanted to ask that I failed to ask you earlier was when you have client control problems, is there any sort of methodology you use to, I mean, because sometimes, you know, are you relying on the defense side to come in to help you control this person that maybe has pie in the sky mentality and thinking they're going to get $10 million? I have not had any of those problems. Um, I've seen it happen, and it's a big mistake that that some even pretty good plaintiffs lawyers make, which is they tell them you're going to get ten million dollars. Uh, mm -hmm. They sign the case up, and then a year and a half later, they're trying to settle it for three million. And right. this person is saying, "Wait a minute, where's my other seven million? Uh, so that yeah. that starts with a decent evaluation up front and managing expectations, um, but. Uh, the good the good plaintiff's lawyers that I've seen usually have pretty good control of their clients. Well, and I think too, um, the fact when someone's done defense work and plaintiff's work, I think it makes you more balanced in the value of things versus only on the plaintiff's side and you want, you know, tens of thousands, millions of dollars. Or billions. Or billions. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you'll have to let me know when, when the bell is rung on that case. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a quick question. When sure. you get uh, folks to agree to confidentiality, do you build into it uh, the consequences if the confidentiality is broken? Sometimes, but it's a lot harder to get plaintiff's lawyers to agree to that. You can put in there that, that if confidentiality is broken, then there's a liquidated damage amount that they have to pay of whatever the number is. But really, for the most part, that's not worth the paper it's printed on because these plaintiffs go out and the money's gone by the time they breach confidentiality. I bet it gets breached a lot more than people know. It just doesn't get out. 
Mm-hmm. Being on the plaintiff side, um, have you any advice for risk managers as to what they should be looking for in choosing a defense lawyer if they're choosing one for the first time? Experience, more than anything. Um, I think you want to know whether this lawyer has actually tried the types of cases, if it's a, a risk manager at a hospital, if they've tried medical malpractice cases, how many, and and were they carrying somebody's bag or actually trying the case? Because it's pretty hard to get experience out there, and you don't want to be the person that's that's giving a first first or second time lawyer uh, a trial on your on your dime where you could end up uh, w- with a big verdict. Well, when you pick a defense attorney, you don't know whether something's going to go to trial or not. Is there any other objective things you could look for in a defense attorney? Well, somebody you like that that sounds like somebody you can you can trust, uh, and if you ask around, uh, you can you can get recommendations for good lawyers. And in most cases, don't go to trial, um, but you will pay a premium if you have a lawyer that the other side knows will never try a case. On every case, you'll pay a premium. Oh, I understand. Do you get to change uh, defense attorneys if something's going to go to trial, or is that a bad idea? Um, it's you can. It's not a. It's not necessarily a bad idea, but it's an expensive idea because uh, the case has been worked up. You bring somebody in that really hasn't lived with the case. They're going to spend a lot of time uh, getting up, getting up to speed. But if you have a really good workup lawyer, um, sometimes. Uh, even maybe within the same firm, they'll bring in a, um, a gray-haired trial lawyer to, to help them try the case. I see. I see. Unfortunately, I'm kind of that person now. I didn't, <laughs> the gray-haired guy that, that can come in at the end. But you don't have gray hair. <laughs> Not that much. <laughs> so, so Leanne, when, when a, a case comes to you and you have to think about things like, um, we're reminding the people around you what the policies are when it comes to um, appearing uh, in front of a plaintiff's attorney. Um, do you have any, do you have any, should you have any, should there be an advice you're giving to your CEO that might be different than the people who are going to de- be deposed? Um, yeah, well, typically, you know, we don't necessarily share coverage information or policy information with those that are being deposed, unless they're an executive and already have access to that confidential information. With regards to sharing information to the CEO, yes, it depends on the allegations that are made in the complaint. For instance, as Ron alluded to earlier in our conversation, if, if somebody pleads that um, there's gross negligence, punitive damages, or those things that are punitive in nature, they may not be covered by your insurance policy. So having, um, you have to know your policy language, you have to know what's covered. And depending on if you have a policy with a carrier or if you're a captive or a risk retention group, those things are handled kind of differently because on the captives and RRGs, you have more autonomy than with a carrier. Because if you're with a carrier, you have a policy limit of X, and if you don't have an excess or an umbrella policy, then the coverage ends after that. And so you have to think of, of potentials. If you take it to trial, if there's a runaway verdict that's more than your policy limit, how are you going to handle that? And those discussions have to be made with your CFO and your CEO. And um, like other situations that I mentioned, it's dollars going out the door. We do pay premiums for those policies. And um you know, we want to make sure that we have the right coverage. So that is also another part of the risk manager's job or should be maybe depending on how things are structured differently at different size institutions, but you you plan and you got to make sure that you have enough coverage across the enterprise to cover things like that. Maybe you have a sexual misconduct or a rape or an attack or workplace violence or, you know, a doctor that ends up doing something intentionally to a patient and that patient dies. Those are problematic scenarios that potentially could leave you what's called bare um, and you may not have insurance for those acts. So, and then then you go down to the next um, question is like, well, so how much money do we have? How do we get the case resolved? If if our policy is not triggered for coverage, um, so it can get pretty complicated, but that's why 
throughout the year. And, you know, um, you have to be operating in those circles with the C-suite, um, the board and that sort of thing. So they know what's going on. The last thing that any of us want is a surprise because we haven't financially planned for it in our actuaries. You know, every year we meet with them and we talk about reserving and having, you know, what is our financial portfolio. So those things are a key community and it goes back to communication and, and actually building those relationships that are going to help you protect the enterprise and mitigate, mitigate against loss exposure. Hmm. What do you do in a case where you find out the surprise is a doctor is not carrying his own insurance? Well, that is a multi-pronged problem. <laughs> you know, they go through <laughs> they go through the credentialing process and you're supposed to verify coverage if they're an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. If they are an employed doc, then they should fall under your umbrella, but you have to make sure that you give the list of doctors um, that you're employing to the carrier so they know. And, you know, there's a ways around that on the back end. And if, if in case maybe you forgot something or somebody's moonlighting at your facility, uh, and or contractually obligated to be at one facility versus another. But um, hopefully that never happens. But if it does happen and they end up having no insurance, that's a problem and you got to cut a deal and figure out what is the best way out of the scenario. So that's when you use skill sets like Ron's to come in and help us get out of the corner because that could really be financially devastating depending on the damages sustained, um, the allegations, the skill of the plaintiff lawyer and whether or not they're reasonable and even want, I mean, if they hone in on that, um, sometimes that's an incentive if they don't, if they know you don't have the money or the limits aren't there. Um, but if you have somebody difficult um, who's erratic, they may not be so logical. I have a close friend. Um, she found out the doctor did not, a foot surgeon did not have insurance and was essentially talked out of pursuing damages for um, them not only messing up one foot, but making the same mistake on the second foot three months later. Oh, uh, so see, see, it's a patient, and yeah, Ryan will comment on this. If you're a patient and that happens, mm -hmm. talk to us about like personal asset exposure. Well, uh, depends on the state, but a lot of personal assets can be exposed. Um, if, I've only had one case in 25 years where the plaintiffs wanted to go after the doctor's personal assets on top on top of his his coverage, uh, and it was a case where they they claimed that he had uh, sexually assaulted his patient, so they wanted blood money. Uh, we ended up getting it settled um, for the for the policy limits. Uh, but it depends on where you are. In Kansas and Missouri, it's very, very rare that the plaintiff's lawyers will go after personal assets of the doctor. They're hard to get. And I, I wouldn't do it because I, I wouldn't feel good about it. Um, but if, if you run out of coverage, uh, your assets can be exposed. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, the, the doctor simply didn't have insurance. They weren't able to renew after apparently um, having some prior history of injuring a patient. And they, they didn't notify the uh, future patients that they're not covered. See, that's poor business practice. And, and that doctor, they should probably report that doctor to the, the board of medical examiners. Mm -hmm. But also, I'm sure, you know, when we talk about personal assets, they might have retirement accounts, they might have mm -hmm. a house that's paid for, they might have cars that are paid for. They can also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ron, those are personal assets that could be seized if, in fact, they do pursue or have an attorney that is skilled enough to go about that if they think the damages are as egregious um, and that somebody needs to pay. Like Ron said, I've never had a case where they've gone after personal assets, but, you know, things are crazy times. And sometimes when people get desperate or, you know, it would be terrible if the patient didn't, you know, have enough insurance and maybe got denied coverage for something um, as a result of a doctor doing something and that doctor didn't have the right coverage. Um, they, we see, we typically see it all. And, um, you know, I think in today's environment, I mean, it's certainly possible. 
Hmm. Well, in that situation, I wouldn't have any problem going after the doctor to see what he's got. Um, because that the practice medicine without malpractice insurance, I, I think it's required in probably every state, some, yeah. some level. Hmm. Well, and two, if it affects your mobility and she had surgery on her feet and, and he, if he um, did a procedure that was not the best technique and she ended up with a totally compromised feet where it affected her mobility, that's terrible because you're that's looking- That's what happened. Yeah, she doesn't have the use of her big toe in either foot now. Oh no. Yeah. You know, you know, an active sailor before this. Oh gosh. That's terrible. Yeah, kind of unfortunately, a doctor that's going blind without insurance probably doesn't have a lot of personal assets that you can that you can get. Mm-hmm. But you never know. Have, yeah. They mm-hmm. may have structured in a way where, you know, you might have to really hunt down. It might not be in their name. It might be in another company name or something like that. I've run onto people that are shady like that. Um, so, yeah. And I think that is, you know, make sure that you do your due diligence as a patient to look at, um, look at these doctors. I mean, I have a friend in Missouri that I'm actually um, her advocate and um, she's having problems with doctors too. And, um, you know, getting the kind of care and the testing that she needs. And, you know, it's, you just have to be careful. You can't always go off of somebody saying, oh yeah, that doctor's good. I know him. I'm looking, you know, look on the various websites that uh, house information, whether or not they have claims and whether or not they've been turned into the board, that sort of thing. Well, even as a patient, uh, I've never thought to ask the doctor if they have insurance. And I, I have asked the doctor, um, you know, uh, I'm going to go get a second opinion on something. And in the case of my own foot doctor, I was told it doesn't make any sense. This procedure, we do it, you know, we do about um, 10 to 15 of these every month. I've been doing this for years. There's never been a negative outcome. And then when I had the negative outcome, I'm not sure if I shared that with you, you Leanne. Um, I'm, you know, showing up, I have to have a second operation, um, you know, in the doctor's office in a wheelchair. And, and I'm talking to the nurse. I said, so I'm the first one that's had a problem like this. She says, no, this happens to, you know, one out of 10 patients. <laughs> he didn't tell you that, I assume. I, no, that was the <laughs> exact <said> never. opposite. <laughs> right. But you have a case. It's yeah. called informed consent. Yeah. Oh, and, and how, how many years can I go back on that? Two in a lot of states, maybe a little longer, depending on where you are, uh, but typically two. I'm probably too good natured of a person to do it, though, and the two years is up. Yeah. In any event, I didn't, I'm not asking for personal advice here. Um, <laughs> so so I, I was thinking surprises. Um, any other surprises risk managers uh, might want to figure out before, uh, very early on in the process? Or is that part of RCAs? Not that I can think of. I'm sure I could come up with some things. There are lots of things that could pop right. up. Okay. Yeah, for me, it's um, the surprises I've had were like coverage issues, contract issues with physicians mm-hmm. and or traveling nurses, um, that sort of thing. And, or, you know, there might be some weird twist with a patient and or family where, you know, oftentimes they come in, they're like, oh yeah, I have a medical power of attorney and it's a financial power of attorney. It's not a medical power of attorney. So you have to be very detail oriented to catch those sorts of things. Um, And, you know, the weird scenarios that we run into is like end of life care and whether or not somebody's a DNR or you know, have they filled out a post form and, you know, what if they revoke it? And then you don't know that they revoke it. And that kind of stuff is real stuff that happens. So it's, it can be very, you know, stressful. Um, Or if you have a Jehovah's Witness come in and, you know, they don't want blood products, but the spouse is not a Jehovah's Witness and they are consenting for treatment and they're like, give them blood products. 
So, you know, trying to make sure whoever the provider is feels comfortable and gets the right legal advice and vi- advice from risk management is key. I don't you never know come- what's going to come up. Right. Yeah. I can- that job, and it may be at midnight. Yeah. How about um, when you're uh, going to COVID? Um, I, I heard recently one of my clients um, has decided to tell the entire staff they must be vaccinated or else they'll be fired. As a I, risk manager, what, what should they be thinking about when, when they hear their CEO wants to put forth a policy like that? I think you have to be careful. Um, and I think you need, you know, I think people are rushing into dictating one way or the other. I think you need to give it time to kind of let the dust settle and see what sort of mandates are out there and, and what is actually going to be law and what's not. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, from a personnel perspective, you got to think about, you know, is there any recourse if there's any bad side effects? You know, are you going to be responsible um, if they are refusing to get it? Maybe they have MS or maybe they have an autoimmune disorder, something like that. If you can't guarantee safety when it's given, you know, you don't want to be in that position as an employer where you're dictating one particular thing, because there's always going to be that one person where it doesn't go so well. And then where are you going to be? And are you really willing to terminate staff? If, you know, the other thing is, are they involved in patient care, you know, or are they working from home? It doesn't really make sense if you're mandating and if they're working from home, but if they're, they're at the bedside, maybe you can make the argument that, you know, it does make sense for safety. So, from a, that's my risk management lens. I think you have to be careful and we have to understand all sides of the coin before we put our, our stamp on something. Now, Ron, as a litigator, he might have a different uh, view on that. I, I don't know the um, legality of that, but I, I do know it's, it's happening. Uh, uh, there was a hospital uh, Methodist maybe in Houston did it. They fired mm-hmm. 50, 60 people like six months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think that's up in the air. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have those situations where people are saying it's my body, my choice. And they're right in that aspect. I mean, why would you be forcing um, a vaccine on somebody that might be against, you know, their personal um, beliefs, or they might have physical issues um, that might put them at a higher risk for something going wrong. And I think, you know, as risk managers, we have to be neutral and balanced and hear all sides of the coin. And I think if you have a CEO that's doing that, they need to be careful and kind of take a step back. Does it make sense? Are you willing to take on that risk from an employer standpoint, um, because you know there's there's you know growing groups of people that do not feel like you know they would get it. So I would just say, be cautious. Let things kind of play out. Don't follow suit. Don't be a follower. You know, be an independent decision maker and weigh the facts and the science. Because I know um, there's multiple podcasts from multiple credentialed doctors that treat nothing but COVID patients. And I would have them listen to all the science first and ask them at the end, after they've listened to all of it, do they still have the opinion? Where are the risks? Where are the benefits? Um, And and where does that put the institutional risk? Um, As well as the employer risk, uh, employee risk, I should say. So I would be careful. Because I know at some point we're going to see more litigation about that. And, you know, I know some things have been defeated that have been appealed, but, you know, only time will tell. And, you know, it'll be interesting a year and a half from now where we are um, in that position. Yeah. Hey, one last question um, I I wrote down here. Um, You mentioned it's expensive to um, aggravate or tick off a, a plaintiff. Um, what advice do you give to, um, the people around you, um, 
how do you balance not taking them off versus you know other considerations that are all the different things you want your employees of your healthcare system to be thinking of when they either meet the uh, a plaintiff or or working with their attorney in a, de a deposition or or anything else. I don't. Know if, I wonder if I can simplify that question. Yeah, well, I think you know in the work that we do it can become really expensive really quickly. Mm -hmm. And it does, I think we have to be careful um, digging our heels in on anything. And if we dig our heels in, we better have a good reason. Otherwise uh, the dollars keep churning. And then, you know, it does no one good to develop a poor relationship, especially with, you know, our partners are not only the defense lawyers and the CEOs and the doctors and nurses, they're also the plaintiff lawyers in the city and the community in which we live. And so when we represent our institution, we need to be, or we should want to be known as fair, um, equality, you know, justice, truth. We should be truth seekers. And, you know, we shouldn't be known and have that reputation out there that we're trying to screw everybody over and that we're gonna cut a deal on the side. The word travels fast, especially if you're in a smaller community. And those kinds of things, if you are a nasty, um, person and just are looking for a fight, you're going to pay a premium like Ron indicated, you know, on some of these cases that we, we may not even be in a claim yet. Say, for instance, you get a situation through a grievance um, department and uh, there's an upset family. That's the first opportunity you have to quash it and to make things right. And you don't, you don't do anything about it. You just let it ride. You're like, I'm not paying that. That's ridiculous. Um, he lost his hearing aid and he, his teeth, he swallowed his teeth and, you know, now he can't eat. Well, that's a problem because then you have your daily living needs that cannot be met. That's how you get a bad reputation for not doing the right thing. I had a situation in which this guy came in, he was older. I think, Ron, I think you were involved in that case where he went in with teeth, he came out and he's like, where's my teeth? He was like 80 or 90. And we did an x-ray of his stomach and his teeth were in his stomach. And I asked the person that did the, the um, intubation, and I was like, did you use a different blade? No, I, you know, how could you not know that you broke teeth and they're now down in the guy's stomach? So that sort of thing, if we left it to that provider, they wouldn't have done anything. They're like, they were just like, no, I didn't do anything wrong. I used the same blade as I always did, but this guy's gotta be able to eat, come on. You know, and that's where doing the right thing and seeking the truth really matters because at the end of the day, it's lonely at the top. We're usually standing alone with our lawyer, <laughs> you know, because everybody else goes about their business and we have a duty to do the right thing and to seek the truth and seek justice and to make those whole that have been injured or harmed. What a great way to end this. Teeth. Yeah, what a great way to end this episode. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, thanks for listening. If you want more, be sure to click like or subscribe. If you like to appear on our program, be sure to fill out the survey monkey below. Most important though, if you know someone who should hear this video, please forward it to them so that together we can all work to make healthcare just a little bit less risky.